That honestly is a perfect spot to stop. So I'm gonna pick up right where he dropped it. He felt it. Um, <clears throat> so Josh um, laid out covenant family, foundations, a lot of stuff we talked about yesterday, picking right up where he left. Right? He's speaking of the, the faithfulness of the one leading to the blessings of the many uh, and the faithlessness of the one leading to curses to the many. This is what we're going to talk about now, specifically uh, discipleship in the home, right? Discipleship in the home. What does it look like to be faithful with the charges that you have been given? So our text we're going to walk through is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. Again, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. I'm going to walk through this text. We'll do a summary of the text, pulling out truths from it, and then we'll dive into a few key points. We'll obviously start by reading the text. So these are the words of the Lord. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers, night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, of love, and of self-control. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this morning, this opportunity to gather as your people and your world in this church building. We praise your great and holy name. We are overjoyed to enter your presence uh, singing the doxology to your glory. We thank you for preserving this specific text for us to use for our good, for our growth, and our general encouragement. I pray that you would give us the grace that we need to handle it purely and faithfully, uh, to bring glory to your holy name, and to bring edification to all of us as uh, sons and daughters, and husbands and wives, and fathers and mothers, Lord. We ask these things in the name of the only and blessed Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, like I said, we're talking about the faithfulness of the few blessing the many. That just high level, very quickly, is the pattern, like Josh is speaking, right? We are called to multiply. This is not a onesie, twosie sort of thing. Just on a mathematical level, one child is not multiplication, it's subtraction. Two is no addition whatsoever. Three, okay, now we're starting to get into at least some level of multiplication. So, maybe a high level encouragement is have kids and have lots of them. It is a joy, as we talked about last night, right? It brings a lot of enjoyment, and it brings glory to God. And that's what we're going to talk about today, how to raise children faithfully, how that could go wrong, what are some of the temptations, and then some encouragement at the end, lest we despair in our task, because it is a very big task. So we're going to start just by reviewing this text, walking through it verse by verse, uh, this is very similar to what I would do in family worship, just this is a deeper dive, right? During family worship, and we'll, we'll talk about that specifically. There's cursory teaching and exhortations, but we're going to do uh, a bit more of a deep dive than I would normally do. So, starting off, uh, I want to give context for 2 Timothy. This is the last letter that Paul wrote before he was executed. These are the last written words of the Apostle Paul. And he chooses to write these words to his spiritual son. He knows where his life is headed. He knows what's coming for him. And he is writing to his son, his co-worker, Timothy. We'll see specifically from our text tonight that Paul had a very strong relationship with Timothy, uh, that he was filled with love toward him. Timothy uh, reciprocated these emotions. Right? He loved Paul. He was endeared towards Paul. Um, and we'll see that as well. So Paul is writing to encourage Timothy at the end of his life. He's encouraging him. Uh, to abide in sound doctrine, and to pers persevere in his post in Ephesus. So Paul is a father writing to his son. 
And it's his last words. He sent his son out. He's done the hard work of teaching, training, equipping, building, crafting, and sending. And so now he's dealing with some of the frustrations, the fears, the concerns that Timothy might have. He starts this letter by clarifying his power, his authority, and where it comes from. Right? He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. I am an apostle by God's will. Well, why, though? Well, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. So again, already right off the bat, I'm an apostle, I'm your leader, I'm your teacher, but it's by the will of God, and it's for life. Right? Remember that life comes from and only from Christ, from nowhere else. Remember, Paul's on his deathbed. He knows he's about to lose his life. He's saying that life comes from Christ. Um, in the next verse, we see the love of Paul toward Timothy, in which he calls him his beloved son, to Timothy, my beloved child, uh, encouraging him that he is, uh, in fact, loving him. He's spent many, many years building him up and equipping him. At this point, he's probably spent somewhere around 13 to 17 years with Timothy before sending him out. Curiously, that's about the same amount of time we have with our children uh, when we can equip and train and send them out. We can see that Paul starts this epistle just as he does many of his others, right? With this grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, one of the things that uh, my pastor says often is we see this grace, peace, and mercy as uh, the Spirit who comes from the Father and the Son. Right? So this is a Trinitarian blessing he's giving to his children. Again, going back to the doxology, why is there some power in some of these older hymns, the Trinitarian nature of them, recognizing God for who he is. So Paul is calling his son back to that. But there's a very curious difference in First and Second Timothy than in all of the other epistles that Paul wrote. Literally, all of the other epistles leave out the mercy part. It's grace and peace to you. There is intention there for sure, right? So Paul is reminding Timothy of the mercy that we have. And I'm sure many of us who are parents would uh, relate to this as we think towards our own prayers for our children. We know their sins. We know their weaknesses. We know their flaws. And we beg God to have mercy on our children. Paul is doing the same thing here. Lord... Timothy, uh, the Lord has had mercy on you. He has sent his mercy to you. So we, uh, we should be asking that uh, God would maintain our children's covenantal standing, right? They are covenantal children. They, uh, we want them to grow up into a full-orbed understanding of the truths of Scripture and the love of the faith that we are passing on to them. And that's, Paul, uh, that's what Paul is doing here. So uh, I am an apostle. I have authority. I love you. Uh, you have grace, mercy, and peace. And then he turns to generational faithfulness. He pulls Timothy's eyes towards his mother, his grandmother, Paul's ancestors. Right? This is verses 3 through 5. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors. And he talks about Lois uh, and Eunice as well. Why is he doing that? Well, what he's communicating is you have this faith that has been tried. It is true. It's been tested. Uh, maintain it. Build upon it. You've been passed down a heritage, a lineage that is of great value. And he says, also, I'm praying for you often. You are constantly in my prayers night and day. I think about you consistently. I love you. I care for you. Uh, he acknowledges Timothy's tears. As I remember your tears, I long to see you. Why? Well, because you bring me joy. Right? I understand that your life is difficult. Your life is hard. I'm praying for you. He's encouraging his son. I can't wait to see you again is what he's saying. And this is the way that we should be talking to our children just in the household. Right? I love you. Uh, as, as little things that feel petty or small to us bring our children to tears, we should be loving them, encouraging them, comforting them. Those are our roles. And then also teaching them how to work through those things and rise up into mature manhood and womanhood. From this encouragement, Paul turns to an exhortation. Right? So from his place of power as father and love as father, he calls Timothy to have self-control. Right? I'm an apostle. I love you dearly. Have self-control in the midst of these moments. Right? And as we look at our children, there are many moments 
where we have the power of their parents and love, and we want them desperately to have self-control, even as two-year-olds, even as four-year-olds, especially as two-year-olds, especially as four-year-olds. And that's what we're calling them up into, and Paul gives us a good example of this. Right? He says, we do not have a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and self-control. And he's highlighting all that throughout the text. So Paul is writing as an accomplished father. Like I said, he's worked hard to build up Timothy, to send him out uh, to do the, do the work here. And that is what we're going to dive into. We've walked through the text. And so a few key things to highlight uh, that uh, we must be setting the example. The primary way to disciple in the home is through modeling, not directly through teaching. But secondarily, we should be teaching as well. Right? Our children will remember 90% of what we do and 10% of what we say. And so we must be doing more than saying. And then we'll look at maybe a couple temptations uh, and um, how we have a need to release our children into the world. So living faithfully. First thing that Paul says and points to is that his faith is alive and well. In verse 3 it says, I thank God whom I serve as well as my ancestors. This means he is daily repenting of his sins. Daily uh, looking to Christ, picking up his cross refusing to grumble and complain. And Paul has many a reason to grumble and complain, right? We know his life. We know what he did. Um, but he doesn't do that. He joyfully goes about his duty as a Christian man. On a personal note, this point of example hits home very strongly. Uh, when I was a, a child, kind of uh, to some of what Josh was saying, right? It's, uh, we've heard the, well, I, I had a bad dad. I didn't have a good example, um, my, I, I have that excuse, if you will, right? My father was a, a very poor father uh, when I was a young man, uh, culminating in uh, divorce and uh, the wreckage of my family. Now, long story short, and it is a long story, and I love to tell it. Um, I would love to tell you guys it sometime, but I do not have time this morning. Uh, we would be here all day. Um, when I was, so, so my family got divorced when I was 12. Uh, I left my mom, my brother, and I, we left my father behind. I did not really see him or interact with him for about three years. And I didn't want to. I hated him. There was a deep, resting hatred of the man who was harsh, the man who was angry, the man who was volatile, and how all of those things broke my family. Right? Well, other things in life brought me back around to my father when I was 15, and I moved back in with him. Now, I had grown up in the church and spent a lot of time in the church learning the doctrines of the faith. Um, but at this point in my life as a young 15-year-old who hadn't had a father for three years, what I would have told you was, yes, Jesus lived. Yes, Jesus was a good teacher. But he died. Where's he at? Right? If he rose from the dead, where's he at? He's not here. And so, sure, all that stuff in the Bible happened 2,000 years ago. Great. Great. We can learn some stuff and I can be a better man. But there's no power in this aside from that. It's important. Um, when I moved back in with my father, he had spent, the, the Lord had brought him to his knees. He had lost his family. Uh, we had a restraining order. Because of that, he had lost his life, livelihood. He had lost his job. He had lost, um, we were a big hunting family. He lost his guns. He lost everything. Uh, and we lived up in the middle of nowhere, in the boonies, like literally middle of nowhere. I shot a bear on my front porch at 3 a.m. once, like, like out there. Um, I got followed home by a cougar, like those sorts of things. Um, and he would come home from job hunting and find a casserole dish on his front porch. Because our church that we had been going to, that he had been getting in as late as possible and getting out of as quickly as possible, right? Sitting in the back row, our church noticed. And they loved him and they cared for him. And so this had started to happen. My pastor had come to him and uh, lovingly encouraged him, but also rebuked him and called his sin out, which brought him to repentance and clarity of understanding of his weaknesses and his sins. This had been going on for three years. And so when I stepped back into his life as a 15-year-old, not having any interaction with him, the man that I stepped back into relationship with was drastically different. There's a moment where I had stolen some money from him as a 15-year-old shortly after I moved back in, and uh, he had found out, and uh, I was like, okay, here we go. I know what I'm getting into. And he sat me down on the couch and got on his knees, and he repented to me of his lack of fatherhood for 15 years of my life and said, don't steal from me. Everything I have is yours. Just ask. And I was jaw-dropped on the floor, 
I don't know how to comprehend this. What's happened? My father was living faithfully. He was serving the Lord. And that example flipped a switch in my head. This is real. Jesus is alive. Because he was here. He's doing something. He is here. My father is a different man. This example in the home has so much more lasting effect than you can think. You must be reading God's word. You must be repenting of your sin, even to your two-year-old. It does not undo your authority whatsoever. If anything, it bolsters it. Why? Because your authority is not your own. The only authority you have has been given to you from God. You are a steward. You are an underling. You are a sub-king of the king of kings, and you have been tasked with raising his son, his daughter, who will live forever. Your authority comes from him. Remember that. Part of this duty, right, we've talked about the example that we live, the example that we set, uh, the way that we interact with the people around us, and how our children latch onto that. That's 90% of the teaching and training. But we are called to teach. We are called to use our words and to <coughs> exhort them. And so I want to call this the duty of family worship. We've talked about this, hinted at it loosely throughout the weekend. We're going to dive into this much more in detail here. So... Part of this duty is putting the spirit of the Lord into our children. Right? As we're reading our text here, in verse 6, Paul says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. He follows that up by giving God credit, of course, and pointing out that we have a spirit. But he, uh, he says, you have this spirit in you, and I know you have it because I put my hands on you. I taught you. This is my work. God used me <laughs> as a means in your life to grow in righteousness. We see other explicit calls for us to do this in Deuteronomy 6 and Ephesians 5. So those verses really quick, right? Deuteronomy 6 teaches us to teach the laws of God, the words of God, the logos, right? The word of God to our children diligently. It says, uh, teach it to them while you sit in your house, when you wake up, when you go to bed, when you walk along the way. Like literally what it's saying is all the time, what you're doing is you're teaching. And you should be teaching your sons and daughters about God, who he is, uh, and uh, how we are called to interact with him. Ephesians 6 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, he's specifically speaking to fathers as the head of the household, right? Speaking to covenant, right? The blessings come from the one being faithful. And uh, as father and mother, we are called to, ta to do that, but the father has the ultimate responsibility. Now, he might delegate that to his uh, CEO of Internal Affairs, his wife, right? Um, and, and they do these things together. But specifically in the duty of family worship, this is the responsibility of the father to uh, bring your children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, right before this passage in Ephesians 6, Paul is actually talking about husbands washing their wives with the word, right? So he has in context this role of caring, teaching, washing with the word, and he says, do it to your wives and do it to your children. Bring them up in the nurture and the admonition. What is family worship, though? I'm going to talk about this just on a practical level. Family worship contains three main components. Scripture with instruction, singing, and praying. It really is that simple, right? We're modeling the worship service that we have. Uh, when we go into church. That's it at its core. But why in the home? Why those three things? I'm not going to spend too much time on that. We're just going to read a number of verses that I think, again, going back to Scripture, Scripture is our end-all, be-all. Test everything I say by Scripture. We're just going to walk through some Scripture uh, to say why in the home, why should we read Scripture, why should we sing, and why should we pray. So in our houses, Joshua 24, 14 through 15. You guys are probably very familiar with this text. This is the very end of the book of Joshua. Uh, where they've gone into Canaan, they've basically taken over. Joshua is a phenomenal read if you have little boys because there's a bunch of warfare and a bunch of slaughtering. And you, like, yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, it's great. Uh, Joshua is a uh, total Chad. Like, he's awesome. <laughs> uh, and curiously enough, side note, um, Joshua and Jesus are the same name. Jesus is the new Joshua. And the whole principle that we hear about of the footstool, uh, enemies of Christ being put under his footstool, that is a reference to Joshua when the seven kings are pulled out of the cave and they're put, their necks are put under his heel. 
curiously enough, we go back to Genesis, and uh, the uh, uh, enemy, the serpent, is put under the foot of uh, the offspring of Eve, right? Really cool patterns. It's wonderful. <clears throat> so, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That word serve could also be translated worship. We will worship the Lord. Me and my house, in my house, we will do this. All right, so Joshua is taking responsibility for him, his bride, and his children, and they will be doing this in their home. So in the house, we should be doing this. Reading scripture, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Well, what words? Oh, scripture, right? Scripture, reading scriptures. Teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, uh, those things that I had mentioned previously. Ephesians 6, 4, don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Well, where do we know what the discipline and the instruction of the Lord is? How do we learn that? From Scripture, right? That's what God's given it to us for. And then Colossians 3, 16, this is the passage I taught from last night, right? Uh, in there it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing, oh, curious thing, we'll get to our next point here, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. All right, so let the word of God dwell in you richly. And then the next point, singing, right? Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And then Psalm 118, verse 15 says, glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. Glad songs of salvation. There's a wonderful glory that we get from learning the truths of Scripture through song and singing them throughout the day. The doxology, you will hear that in my house on repeat, and we're not playing it. My boys are singing it. Like, it's just everywhere, right? Like, they'll be playing with Legos, and you hear them, praise God from, like that, or praise to God the Father be. Like, man, I get home and I hear that. I'm like, praise God, right? They're encouraging me to praise God. This singing, these songs of salvation should be in the tents of the righteous. And then praying. Um, Jeremiah 10, 25 says, Pour out your wrath on the nations that know you not, and on the peoples that call not on your name. Pour your wrath out on the peoples that do not call on your name. We should be praying. We should be calling upon the name of the Lord. So brief template, just like, okay, let's get down to brass tacks. What's this look like? In my home, we spend about 20 minutes, right? That's about reasonable right now. I have a one-year-old and I have an eight-year-old. There's a big span there, right? So part of our task is teaching so that the entire range of our children get fed from the scriptures, right? So what I typically do is we're reading through different sections of scripture. I typically read a psalm, um, and I, oftentimes, psalms are somewhat repetitive. For instance, what we read last night uh, was uh, Psalm 135, um, and the boys participated uh, in that psalm, and they had a great time doing it. Psalm 136, sorry. Psalm is his steadfast love endures together. We'll do a little bit of what we did last night. It's a longish song, so we don't do the whole thing. So I started by saying, okay, boys, this is fun. You're going to participate with me in this. I'm going to read a line, and then you're going to say the next line, and you're going to know what it is without looking. And you're like, ooh, fun, cool. So give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Pause. And they're like, what? For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. Yeah, and there's like 30 of them. So we had fun, right? The boys are enjoying that. They're participating. We read a, a psalm, and then we're reading one other book. I typically do a psalm every day. We want to be reading the song book of God as well as singing it. Um, and then so psalms, and right now we're doing Genesis. We do a chapter, uh, and then I teach as we walk through it, right? And we just read Cain and Abel. It's like, ooh, why did Cain kill his brother? Well, out of jealousy. What was Cain's curse, right? So we're interacting with the text, not necessarily deep, deep diving, but we're dealing with it. So, so reading scripture, uh, teaching it, 
uh, scene. I messed up my papers here. Give me a second. Oh, so after we do scripture, uh, we do uh, catechism questions. We talked about it a little bit last night. We're walking through Westminster Shorter. I started with the New City Catechism. It's awesome. It's got a children's mode you can turn on. Very simple answers. Um, they also have little songs you can play. Uh, as a side note, take note here, Brian Sauvé is a wonderful artist that has made a number of songs that pair with the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Right? So uh, we learn things well by singing. And so being able to ask a question and then respond by a song helps solidify that truth. And the church has been using that method for thousands of years. Uh, so it's very, very helpful. Uh, we usually do three to five questions, and then we would work on a new one. And this is literally down to my three-year-old. If I ask my three-year-old, how did God make man? He can say uh, male and female. In his, and he says uh, female and female right now. We're, work, we're working on that. <laughs> we're working on that. Uh, male and female uh, in his image in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness with dominion over the creatures at three. It says the whole thing, right? We can talk about the Trinity. Um, there's only one God, the holy and the true God. Some of you guys saw a video of my three-year-old answering these questions last night. Uh, so catechism questions, and then we'll sing a song. It'll be the doxology, Psalm 134, the Gloria Patri, simple songs with profound truths that they can sing and remember. I want them to be emblazoned in their memory so that if and when they're in a prison cell as an adult, they're singing the Gloria Patri. They're singing Psalm 134. They're singing the doxology. Because I want to raise boys that are going to be like Paul or be like Timothy or be like Jesus. And they cause problems at times. Uh, and then we pray. We pray together as a family unit. So all of this can and be should, should, should be done with brevity, right? This isn't a full church service, right? Your two-year-old is going to have struggles with that. We want it to be an informative time without stretching them beyond their capacity, so, which is maybe what I'm going to do with you guys this morning because I'm going to go over and stretch you beyond your capacity. Hopefully not. Um, so uh, our job is to craft our children and equip them to love God and serve him all the days of their life. Uh, it's one of the highest callings we have. It is the highest calling. Probably one of the things that brings the most value, as Josh said. Uh, they are sons and daughters of the living God. They are not our sons. They are not our daughters. So we should be teaching them to love their father through loving their father and their mother. The caution here is to not get presumptuous. As we go about faithfully living and faithfully teaching our children, one of the side effects, no, actually the main effect, is that we find that our children come to love the Lord. That's kind of the goal, right? That's what we want. They see his goodness. They see his justice. They see his sovereignty. They become regenerate. Thus, we have kids who hold to the same faith as their parents and their parents' parents and their parents' parents' parents. Right? God is a generational God. He's a covenantal God. He makes covenants with people. This is the goal. However, one of the slights or one of the disses or maybe some of the arguments that might get thrown at generational Christians is you're just a Christian because your parents are. Or if you were born in India, you'd be Hindu. How do we respond? Well, our response should be akin to praise the Lord. I know that my Redeemer lives. You're right. God is sovereign. God works with people. God is a covenantal God. He blesses those whom he chooses, and he proclaims his love to thousands of generations of those who love him. And I'll dive into this later, but this is why stories are so important, because we get to tell the stories of the generations and why the blessings of God are on the land and the people of that land. Put another way, the Lord discriminates. He gives privilege. That's okay. That's the way God works. This is the way he works. Along these lines, one of the things we see in the text is that generational faithfulness is not a sure thing. It takes work. Paul kind of alludes to this. He says, and now I am sure this faith dwells in you, talking about Timothy's faith. By saying, I am sure, he's also saying that surety is not a sure thing. There are a lot of sures in there, so I'm going to say that again, right? By saying, I am sure, he is saying surety is not a sure thing. Proverbs tells us that the fathers are the glory of their children, and 1 Corinthians 7 tells us that children of one believing parent are holy, and they are. They are holy. They are set apart. They are covenantal children. However, a blessing squandered becomes a curse. We talked about that yesterday. 
Thus, a warning. In Christian culture, one in which we are surrounded by saints who are like-minded, with robust Christian businesses built growing up around us, with solid Christian education, whether that be private school or home school, whatever that might look like, it would be easy to sit back and think holiness is in the air, right? Like all of my friends are solid Christians. Their kids are solid Christian kids. Most of what we do is Christian. Uh, we, we can think that by being a part of a community like that, half the work is done, right? And to some extent, that's true. It really is in the air, but we have to remember why it's in the air. The reason it's in the air is because True Christian community comes from fervent, consistent faith lived out in the lives of individual fathers and individual mothers. That's why it's in the air. It's because we are all being faithful in our own lives. The blessings come from industrious Christians, industrious in the home and industrious in the world. Christians who are looking to put the enemies of Christ under his footstool. Christians who are conquerors, taking dominion themselves in their own lives. That's their task. They understand it. And the instant we start pointing to our surroundings or our lineage uh, and saying, well, my great grandfather was a reformed Presbyterian minister and so was my father. And so, and oh, I have this. That is the instant that our lives are in danger of becoming like the Pharisees and the Jews. I'm going to hop to Romans chapter nine, verses one through five really quick. Paul says, I am speaking the truth in Christ that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart great sorrow, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong those things. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. These people that Paul is describing, they are the Pharisees. The Jews raised in the covenant. However, they no longer have a hold of the adoption. They no longer have a hold of the blessings. So the caution here is to not get presumptuous or lazy. Do the work in your home. Be faithful. Lead family worship. Point to Christ over and over and over again. Scripture has a fair bit to say. Joss touched on this, so I'm going to skim through this section. The wise inherit honor. Fools get disgrace. Foolish son is ruin to his father. Wise son makes a glad father. Foolish son is sorrow to his mother. He who does violence to his father chases away his mother is a son who brings shame. Right? So when we read all this in parallel with Psalm 127, right, which talks about the blessings of a quiverful, what we must assume is that a quiverful of crooked arrows is not a blessing. They will not shoot straight. Oftentimes, they won't even fire. They'll shatter on being sent out. Rebellious, disobedient, foolish children are not a blessing. They are a curse. They're a curse due to our unfaithfulness. <coughs> They're discipline from the Lord given to parents who have not been faithful in this charge. And this is why that one-and-a-half-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old needs to get spanked for saying no or having a bad attitude. We don't want to raise Jonah's. Jonah said no. He fled. He ran. God is sovereign. He made it work still. Jonah had a bad, bad attitude. Right now, Jonah could actually be considered one of the most successful prophets. Nineveh was not a small city. And he brought the whole city to its knees in submission to God. They repented. God's wrath turned away. But Jonah is not the upstanding character we would want to see right? He's whiny. He's grumbly. He's rebellious. When you see a one, two, three-year-old saying no and throwing a fit, see Jonah when they're grown. We don't want to raise little Jonas. We want to discipline and train. We need to be sure, like Paul is of Timothy, of our family's faith. We must trust the promises of God and obey the commandments, right? The promises to a thousand generations, uh, raise them up and they will not depart. Well, the commandments are teach them diligently, Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, right? So trust the promises, and the way we trust is by living out faithfully. We trust that this is going to happen, and so we do the things we're called to do. That passage in Romans 9 we read uh, continues by saying, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. 
It is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. We are the offspring of God, and his word has not failed. Abide in sound doctrine. Fathers and mothers, it must be taught in your homes. In your homes. It's not a task of the pastor primarily. It is your task. His task is to feed you so you can feed your children. And of course, he helps, but... God is faithful to a thousand generations of those who love him, and those who love him will train their children to do likewise. Okay, we're training, we're teaching, uh, we're putting energy into the industry, the economy of the household. The next thing we need to do is we need to pray, and we need to pray a lot, right? We got this from the text as we're reading it. Uh, Paul prays consistently for Timothy. He's lifting him up before the Lord. Uh, we need to be coming before God. He, Paul, is like Job, who is continually offering sacrifices for his children uh, just in case they had sinned and not repented of it themselves. Right? We see that in the beginning of Job, Job chapter 1. Uh, the uh, takeaway from that passage is that Job's kids were older because if they were younger, there would be no in case they sinned. Right? It's who sinned and then who came in and sinned in response to the sin and how'd the third kid get in there and what sin did they bring, right? Like little ones, which a lot of us have, it's, it's pretty obvious. Uh, so we should be doing things like Job did. We should be praying for them consistently. Psalm 127 starts the way it does for a reason. I'm going to read the way it starts here in a second. Uh, it can be easy to focus on the latter half of the psalm where it talks about children are a heritage from the Lord, uh, have a quiver full of them. Uh, he who has one will stand in the gates, right? Like lots of blessing there. But the psalm starts by saying, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. This next verse, I think, is very, very helpful for wives and for moms. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. So, who is sovereign? Who loves our children more than we do? Who wants good, for, good things for them? more than we do. God does. In my house, we like to say that God is sovereign over the particles and the planets, right? In Genesis 1, he created the planets. He's sovereign over the planets. And in Job 38, we actually see that God plans out the pathway of the lightning bolt. So uh, engineer, right? Let's talk about that really quick. The way lightning bolts flow through the sky is through electron placement and dust particles, right? That's what actually plans the pathway of the lightning bolt and where it's going to hit. And Job 38 teaches us that God plans every electron placement. So he's sovereign over the planets and the particles. This is very important for us to teach our children and consider as we pray to him, right? He is in control. He will keep them safe, safer than we will. So we want to dare to enter the Holy of Holies on behalf of our children constantly, just like Paul does for Timothy. You are in my prayers constantly. Pray that the Lord would bestow grace, mercy, and peace on our children. Ask that he would have favor on you as you raise them. This is something my wife and I pray often, right? So in not getting presumptuous, in being faithful parents, in doing the work of modeling and leading family worship, we consistently pray, Lord, have favor. Because if you don't have favor on this, it's all for naught. I can do all the right things. I can lead family worship every day and diligently teach these things to my children. But if the Lord doesn't have favor on that, it's not going anywhere. The Lord builds the house, not me. Now, we do those things and we trust the promises because God is faithful and he will fulfill those promises. Pray God's promises back to him. Com Psalm, uh, Proverbs 16, 3, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Lord, we commit this work of parenting to you. We commit our children to you. Please fulfill your promise. Proverbs 22, 6, train a child up in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Lord, we are training our sons and daughters to seek you, to turn from their sins. Let them not depart from their faith. Shield them from turning to the right or to the left, Lord. Protect them, give them wisdom. Pray over them and then send them out. We need to send our children out. They are not meant to be kept at home. This is really obvious, right? Easy, even in our culture right now, we look on the 25-year-old in his parents' basement playing video games and doing nothing, and none of us thinks that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. They're supposed to leave the nest. But they're supposed to leave the nest dangerously. They're arrows. They're supposed to be sharp. They're supposed to cut into culture. The 
metaphor of arrow is really, really useful. Uh, if you've ever uh, bow hunted or done archery or watched pros do those sorts of things, uh, the method of selecting an arrow uh, and making sure that your arrows are solid is uh, this kind of uh, intensive review, right? So archers will actually close their eyes and feel along the shaft uh, for any abnormalities and then they'll, they'll flex it a little bit to make sure it comes back, make sure there's no cracking, they'll feel the fletching to make sure everything's straight and true. Um, and I think this metaphor is super helpful for us, right? The early years of our children's life is the sanding of the shaft. We're, we're cutting, we're whittling, we're making a shaft. And we get into those middle school years and we're attaching the fletching, we're doing the finer tuning, the finer, sta uh, finer sanding. The high school years are the flexing to see if they come back to their foundation. Right? And Josh is probably going to talk on this a little bit later, but this really is a classical education. Right? We get into those higher edge, uh, level years and we're stressing, we're testing, we're stress testing them uh, to make sure that they return to their foundation. Another helpful metaphor is concrete. I don't know if you guys have worked with pouring concrete, those sorts of things. It's much easier to mold concrete when it's wet. I don't know if you've tried molding dry concrete. It doesn't work very well. Uh, or if you put up a wall and you have to put a window in and you have to cut concrete out. I've done that a few times. It sucks. It really sucks. You get dust everywhere in your face and your eyes and your ears and your mouth. Um, but if you had just framed that in well beforehand, you wouldn't have to do any of that. Right? So our children are like wet concrete. Impress upon them. Mold them the truths. Mold them in the truths of Scripture. So, conclusion. The end result of faithfulness is the same as the starting point, the worship of God. That worship disciples the nations as we become nations, right? A true understanding of our call leads us to have, to baptize and to catechize our children in a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Paul ends this section with the encouragement and clarification of what spirit we actually live in. He's already modeled this spirit well too, right? In the passage, he's living into his power. He's speaking of his love and he's pointing to his faithfully lived self-control. So he's calling, he's modeling, teaching and modeling. Timothy is called to do likewise. So be good parents. Teach the word, distill the principles and apply them to yourself, to your wife, to your family. Uh, pray often to the great and sovereign Lord who rules over the particles and the planets. Call upon him to bring your work to fruition in faithful children that will then have faithful children that will then have faithful children. Think generationally, not short-term. Think long-term. Craft your children to be sent out into the world fully equipped by the spirit of power, love, and self-control. Worship daily in your household. Orient your children's day around the worship of the Lord. Right? That's what it is. It's a resetting factor every day. At the end of the day, we usually do it after dinner. We're resetting. Okay, wait, what's everything about? Who is this about? What are we to do? Glorify God and enjoy him forever. So we reset consistently. And then we go and we gather with the saints and we have a weekly reset as well that has its blessings that come with this. So the charge is this. Gird up your loins. Most, if not all, of our children are still at home. So show them what a vibrant faith looks like. Model it to them. Craft them, equip them, um, pray over them, weaponize your family. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word in your homes. Be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and testing. Father, we thank you for giving us this word. We thank you for being faithful to a thousand generations. We admire you and we adore you. I pray that we would live empowered lives by your spirit and not the spirit of the world. Help us worship you daily in our homes and give us the strength and courage and wisdom to send out our children with sharp edges, crafted to destroy your enemies. We pray that in all this we would serve you as you deserve to fight and to not heed the wounds, to toil and not seek for rest, to labor and not ask for a reward, save that of knowing that we do your will. Amen.